Our reading today is by Reverend Tess Baumberger. It accompanies this graphic. At the center of this image is love, that heart of universalism, that eternal and all-conquering force. Around it and from it flows values that express that love. This love that sits at the center of this image is not sentimental love or romantic love. It is the love we grow in our communities, a deep and abiding love that affirms our worth no matter what we do or don't achieve or believe. This love is a belief in ourselves and in one another that nothing can rip apart. This love affirms our interdependence. It is a love that says we all deserve to be loved, whether we have been hurt or whether we have hurt others. For some of us, the love at that center of this, the center of this image includes a divine love that holds us tenderly and tightly. It is a fierce, protective, and liberating love. It is a hopeful love, a love that inspires people of goodwill and sacrificial spirit to overcome evil and to make this earth as heavenly as possible. Just and equitable, pluralistic, affirming all people of all nations, all races, and all creeds. Ours is and has always been a heretical faith, a courageous faith, a covenantal faith, and a faith that calls us to work with that all-conquering, liberating love to make this earth a heaven. So our theme for this church year is love at the center. And we started off in the fall talking about that, moved on to some other things, and so we're refocusing ourselves back on this theme. This theme comes out of the work you use are doing at the national level, as we all take time to examine what does it mean to be a Unitarian Universalist in these times. For the past few decades, we've been guided by seven or sometimes eight principles, and this has been foundational as they have helped us to identify our beliefs and define who, how we are in relationship with others and with the world. And the world has changed in the past decades. Technology advances, economic shifts, global relations, and environmental changes have all moved our understanding of ourselves from the insular positions we were once in to a more interconnected and interdependent web in 1985, when our seven principles were first written, airplane travel was expensive and it was not that common. Telephones were wired into houses, there was no Google, and people did not have laptop computers. As these things changed, it changed how we related to the world around us. And as the world has changed, our UU faith tradition has been challenged to change and respond. So the current close examination of our values, principles, and practices is essential if we're going to stay relevant and if we're to keep up with this ever-changing world. As we redefine who we are more and more, we have come to use the concept of love as central to who we are. Our seven principles never make mention of that word love. And now we all recognize that we use it all the time. The National Commission, who's been at task with the work of examining our purpose, has spent several years in open discussions, surveys, and workshops, and out of this has come this statement. The purpose of the Unitarian Universalist Association is to actively engage its members in the transformation of the world through liberating love. As Unitarian Universalists, we draw from our heritages of freedom, reason, hope, and courage building on the foundation of love. Love is the power that holds us together and is at the center of our shared values. We are accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. This places love at the center of all that we do. It is the basis of why we are here. We live according to shared values, but all of these are guided by how we live them through the loving support of each other and of the world. And for this reason, 
it's imperative that we have a mutual understanding of what love is. Because we can get squishy and sentimental if we don't define what we mean by that word love. And I believe that the love that we're talking about as Unitarian Universalists is countercultural to the normal social understanding of love. So first I want to talk about the theology of love, because I know you guys love it when I talk about theology. And then I want to talk about the practice of love. Unitarian Universalist comes from two separate faith traditions. Universalism, as a religious tradition, began as a theological understanding of eschatology, of life after death. While most of the Christian churches taught that there would be eternal hell for sinners after they died, Universalists asserted there was no way that an all-loving God would damn any of God's own people to eternal punishment and torment. They asserted that it was inconsistent with love in an ultimate sense. Instead, an all-loving God would assure that there was universal salvation. All of us would share a place in God's loving heaven. And as our universalist ancestors stopped worrying about the afterlife, it freed us up. It freed us up to the work of bringing heaven to earth, to the commitment we make to this life, to this world. By the 20th century, our focus shifted. We no longer had to defend against a theology of hell in the afterlife. We could begin to address the hell that many of us experience right here in this life. We could address the present life like our opening hymn said, we could bind up the broken, we could set captives free, we could honor those who mourn. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny, meaning that there is no escaping or undoing how interconnected we are and how interdependent we all are. We may consciously or subconsciously draw distinctions between us and them, enemy and friend, good or bad, worthy or unworthy, but no matter how different or how disagreeable, no one is less or more human than any other of us. No one. We are all here in this together. Reverend Gretchen Haley says this, the outcome of this theological claim is what Dr. Martin Luther King described as the beloved community, fueled by and held together by the promises of love, not just any love, but agape love. Whereas other types of love are directed at particular individuals, romantic love or the love of friends, King described agape as the sort of love that makes no distinction between friend and enemy. It's an overflowing love that is purely spontaneous, unmotivated, groundless and creative, the love of God operating in the human heart. King went so far as to call it disinterested love because it is the sort of love that doesn't care whether it is loved back. It is the love that will go to any lengths to restore community. We're talking about a theo theological love that inevitably leads to the practice of love. And the practice of love is critical to how we move in the world. So how do we engage, actively engage in loving the world? Eric Fromm, the psychologist who wrote the book, The Art of Loving, delved deep into the concepts and understandings of love. Contrary to TV dramas and the popular songs we hear on the radio, which are about all about the joys and the deep sorrows of romantic love, Fromm explains that love is not primary, primarily a relationship to a specific person. If it looks like that, like a person loves only one other person but is indifferent to others, it is not love. It is instead merely a symbiotic attachment. 
Fromm contends that love is an orientation of character toward the world as a whole, not toward one object of love. Love is an orientation of character. This orientation of love is a practice, something we act on. In other words, love is a verb. It's not about how we feel, but it is about what we commit to, what we attend to. We weaken the power of love by describing it as an emotion, a feeling that overcomes us, an urge or desire that goes against our will. It is an action we take. Eric Fromm says, and I quote, love isn't something natural. Rather, it requires discipline, concentration, patience, faith, and the overcoming of narcissism. It isn't a feeling, it is a practice. This is what I mean when I say that love is countercultural, because it means that when we don't feel like it, we act like it. Even when we don't feel loving kindness, we act with loving kindness. Even when we don't feel a churning passion, we stay committed to our community. We show up for each other. What I'm talking about here is the integration of love into our lives and into our souls, because love calls us to action. When we truly love the planet, we don't sit idly by as we watch it destroyed. When we truly love our neighbors, we can't watch passively as children go hungry or can't get medical attention. When we truly love the world, we can't be indifferent when strangers attack and harm each other. We act even when we don't feel like it, because we are committed to the concept of love. We put the power of our will into loving others, Together, we put the power of our community into loving the world. Dr. King understood the power of love, the power we all have access to. He said, power with love, without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Love implementing the demands of justice, correcting everything that stands against love. Love is at the center. Love is at the center of our values. Love is at the center of who we are. And love is at the center of what we do. And what do we do? We side with love. We orient ourselves to love, so it is the central defining characteristic of who we are and of what we choose to do in this world. May it be so. Blessed be.